Good afternoon, everyone. This is Corey Mason with Texas Parks and Wildlife. I appreciate you joining us today. I just want to welcome you uh, to our webinar here to discuss the findings of our recent uh, lead and steel shot for harvesting morning dove. And I'm uh, just going to kind of give you a quick overview before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Brian Pierce, the lead author of the study, to give the presentation to you. Uh, so we're going to give a pretty detailed presentation, background, history, methodology, etc., and some findings on the study through the presentation. And then at the end, we'll have an open question and answer session in which you can provide questions in the, in the chat box there. And we'll, we'll address those at the, the latter part. We'll read those questions aloud and answer them for the entire audience. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Brian Pierce, and uh, he will walk you through the presentation. Once again, thank you for being here today. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of my co-authors, Tom Roster, Mike Frisbee, Corey Mason, and Jay Robertson, and I, I'd like to say thank you for joining us. And we're going to try to give you a brief overview of the results of our comparison of lead and steel shot loads for harvesting morning doves. I first want to acknowledge uh, our study participants, particularly our volunteer hunters. Uh, they are the folks for whom this study was conducted, so we appreciate their support and their help. Uh, I cannot thank our observers and necropsy technicians enough. They did a marvelous job under uh, tremendous volume circumstances and, and did a really, really fine job for us. Uh, I want to thank Jay Menefee of Polywad for his help and coming to our rescue when we couldn't find anybody else to uh, produce ammunition to our specifications. And I do want to recognize that uh, Vernon Bevel, who helped kick this study off, is no longer with us. And we certainly uh, appreciate Vernon's support and want to recognize him. So I have a question before we get started. And if you could, please respond in the chat space in the lower right-hand column of your screen. How many of you have actually downloaded and read the paper? I'm hoping quite a few of you have. If you have not, it is available uh, at the Wildlife Society Bulletin early online at this point. So at, at some point, because of the density of information in the paper, uh, you're probably going to be better off downloading it and reading it so you have a, a visual idea of what's going on for comparison. Let me give you an overview real quickly of what we're going to cover today. We're going to go over the background rationale and objectives of why we conducted the study. We're going to talk about the methods or, or how we did the study, the results, and the summary uh, of our findings. I'm going to ask that you please hold all your questions until the end, and I will try to direct them to the co-author most appropriate for answering them. So. Hang on, and we will get there, and then we'll try to answer all of your questions that we can. In terms of background, as many of you know, NGOs uh, in the past three years have filed petitions with various courts to ban lead shot, and that has been co-committing with national concerns over the use of lead shot, resulting in... Uh, discussions uh, at the federal and state agency level in many places. Additionally, several states have already enacted non-toxic shot regulations for use in migratory game bird hunting or on public hunting areas, including uh, for the use of upland game birds. Given that reality, uh, we also have to look at what has happened in the past, and we know from um, the waterfowl studies that were done in the 70s and early 80s that Texas hunters resisted regulation changes um, on the use of non-toxic shock for waterfowl hunting. And our recent human dimension study and the national human dimension study on dove hunters 
showed that dove hunters perceived non-toxic shot to be less effective than lead shot as a group. So in terms of rationale, Texas having the highest harvest uh, and the highest number of hunters in the nation should be the leader in morning dove management and educating our hunters and our public. However, no published scientific peer-reviewed research on wounding loss or killing rates, bagging rates, um, by shot type has been conducted for doves or other diminutive game birds. So a well-designed study building on the experiences from waterfowl lethality was really needed and it was hoped it would yield useful information on whether existing non-toxic loads would effectively harvest morning doves, uh, whether the average hunter would be able to uh, shoot non-toxic shot as well as popular lead loads, and also whether wounding loss would be higher for non-toxic shot uh, in comparison to commonly used lead shot loads. So our objectives were to determine if changes in ammunition type were likely to alter harvest metrics for morning dove. And we wanted to assess the performance of the most popular lead shot load currently being used by Texas dove hunters with the most likely to be used non-toxic alternative under actual field conditions. As such, we wanted to characterize ammunition. We wanted to look at shot outcomes and compare them, and we also wanted to compare terminal ballistics. We also wanted to evaluate whether ammunition performance was governed primarily by pellet density or ancillary factors uh, re determined um, by ammunition makeup. So by that we mean pellet count, pellet hardness and size, pellet density, choke constriction. Uh, other factors that, that may affect um, pattern efficiency and pattern density, as well as uh, the makeup of the ammo. So we're going to talk about methods first. In a brief overview, we're going to talk about the study area, the logistics of conducting the study, how we selected hunters, how we selected observers, how we trained our observers, how we constructed our test ammunition, how we tested our test ammunition, the field data collection procedures, the necropsy procedures and analysis, and the statistical analyses used in the study. In terms of study area, we used private property in Brown, Coleman, and McCullough counties in the central portion of Texas, and those counties uh, combined have an annual morning dove harvest of greater than 250,000 morning doves each year. For logistics, our training areas, hunting areas, and lodging were obtained through the public bid process. In 2008, we had one bidder on the RFP, and in 2009, we had three bidders to select from. Similarly, the study ammunition was procured through the public bid process, uh, again, we only had one manufacturer willing to produce the test ammunition, and that was Polywad. Hunter selection. We selected participants um, in 2008 from a commercial hunting operation, and they did have some requirements. They had to have a Texas hunting license, they had to have no history of game law violations, and they had to be hunter education certified or age exempt. And in 2008, we selected 28 hunters from a pool of over 60 pay-to-hunt customers at a commercial hunting operation uh, in the study area. In 2009, We used a statewide random drawing to select 34 participants from over 10,000 Texas hunting license holders who were HIP certified. Uh, they also had to re have reported harvesting more than one dove in the previous season, and they had to be an annual public hunting permit holder.
All of our observers were natural resource professionals employed by either state or federal agencies, and that was important to limit um, personnel turnover from year to year. Observers also had to meet some pretty stringent requirements. They had to have excellent observation skills. They had to receive specialized safety training for the field work. They had to receive in-depth field training on the methodology used in the study for data collection. And they had to prove their proficiency prior to data collection each year. So in terms of observer training, we conducted classroom and field training uh, in the week prior to data collection each year. And classroom training focused primarily on field data recording methodologies, bird tagging procedures, uh, choke measurements, and uh, pre and post hunt ammunition distribution and collection. We also had our observers issue a hunter questionnaire post hunt uh, each morning and evening, and they also had to um, learn all of the check station procedures for turning in tag dove specimens, data sheets, and ammunition, and spent ammunition at the end of each hunt. Field training focused on observer safety and observer safety procedures and precautions. Uh, we also familiarized all the observers with normal wild dove flight characteristics, uh, identification of struck bird reactions, distance measurement and estimation techniques, correct interpretation of post-shot bird reactions, proper field data entry, and proper tagging of harvested bird specimens. In terms of our uh, training sites, our field training sites included feeding fields and watering holes and tree lines that are pretty common in, in that part of the state. And each of these locations provided uh, typical overhead quartering and pass shooting opportunities uh, that would normally be seen in any hunting scenario. Our observers trained as a group because we had one shooter and therefore they were watching one shot being fired, all of them seeing the same shot on the same bird each time. However, they measured and recorded all of their training data independently. We compared that data with data collected by an assistant working with the instructor who recorded all shot outcomes on a master data sheet and also collected a set of master data tags from tag specimens. And then at the end of each training session, uh, observers were evaluated by comparing observer dad, uh, data sheets and tags to the master data sheets and tags uh, collected by the instructor and the assistant. Ammunition. We used the 2002 Texas Parks and Wildlife Gun and Shot Survey to identify the ammunition component preferences of Texas dove hunters. And what we found in that survey was that Texas dove hunters uh, predominantly used a 12-gauge shotgun. Uh, they predominantly used a 2 and 3 quarter inch shot shell containing either 1 and 1 8 ounce or 7 8 ounce of number seven or number eight lead shot. For test ammunition, we used steel shot for comparative purposes because it was the least expensive of the available non-toxic ammunition alternatives and it was available in a range of pellets comparable to what is preferred by Texas dove hunters. Additionally, a comparison between steel shot at 7.8 grams per cubic centimeter and lead shot at 11.3 grams per centimeter cubic centimeter represents the largest disparity in shot density among the available non-toxic ammunition alternatives. Therefore, if pellet density is the dominant factor influencing 
ammunition performance, then we were more likely to detect a significant difference when comparing steel and lead ammunition types than any other uh, alternative non-toxic shot type. The loads we prepared for the study were all 12 gauge. The lead used seven and a half size pellets uh, in a one and one eighth ounce load, all in two and three quarter inch Fiocchi high brass uh, opaque shotgun cases. Uh, we used steel sevens in a one ounce load, two and three quarter inch, and steel sixes also in a one ounce load, two and three quarter inch. That was done to make sure all of the ammo um, looked the same uh, from the outside. So all the loads were produced by the same manufacturer. Uh, the lead pellets were high quality lead shot containing at least 6% antimony. Uh, the steel pellets were high quality steel shot used for precision surface preparation in the aerospace industry. So basically it's bead blasting medium. Uh, with a hardness value of less than 95 on the diamond hardness scale. The steel loads used a traditional one-piece high-density polyethylene steel shot type wad, whereas the lead loads used a European one-piece low-density polyethylene um, lead shot stitched wad with um, each of the four pedals connected by a series of three tabs. So once again, all the loads were assembled in Fiocchi, brand brown opaque two-piece plastic hulls with um, 16 millimeter brassites, so that would be high brass, uh, and that was done to preclude visual determination of the load contents by the observers or the hunters. Each ammunition type was tested uh, upon receipt to determine um, shot charge weight, actual number of pellets, and actual muzzle velocities. Uh, each ammunition was tested to determine uh, pattern efficiency, and we standardized all pattern testing by using one shotgun, one set of chokes, and one set of fixed distances so that we could isolate differences due solely to ammunition type. Now, the patterns for each load were fired at 20, 30, 40, and 50 yards using a Remington Model 332 12-gauge shotgun with 30 inch barrels using improved cylinder modified and full Remington rim choke screw in type choke tubes. We calculated pattern count as the mean number of pellets in a 30 inch diameter circle centered over the densest portion of the pattern using 10 shots for each load, choke, and distance combination. Similarly, we calculated pattern efficiency or pattern percentage as the mean number of pellet strikes divided by the average number of pellets found in each load, once again at each load, choke, and distance combination. In terms of field data collection, observers reported um, to the ammunition depot uh, prior to each hunt to receive all of their gear uh, and coated ammunition prior to, to going out into the field. Uh, each ammunition type was divided uh, once we had processed it into lots of 100 rounds and assigned an a unique alphanumeric code. A random ink color was applied to the head of the brass rounds in each lot to prevent accidental mixing of ammunition in the field. Preparation of the ammo uh, was limited throughout the study to two researchers, and neither the codes nor the ammunition types being tested were disclosed to anyone during, during the study. For field data collection, our observers were randomly assigned to hunters, and ammunition lots were then randomly assigned to observer-hunter pairs prior to the conduct of each field test. So observers then received the information, ammunition, took it to the field, and dispensed ammunition to the hunters. They recorded data. They tagged retrieved birds taken with a single shot. They retrieved spent uh, ammunition cases and completed the post-hunt hunter surveys. 
observers did not uh, retrieve birds or help the hunter retrieve birds. They did not discuss distances. They did not discuss ranges to objects in the field around where the hunter was. They didn't talk about ammunition, uh, nor did they discuss shooting results with the hunter. What you're looking at now is a copy of the front page of each of the data sheets. So it um, looks pretty complex, but it was actually designed to be efficient for the observer to collect data in the field. So um, you'll note that there's an attempt number in the leftmost column, how many shots were fired in that attempt, what the result was in terms of shot outcome, bagged undifferentiated, um, bagged immobile, bagged mobile, visibly hit but not retrieved, that would be called wounded, and missed, all went in the result column. Uh, the observers also recorded the actual distance of each shot fired, the actual dimensions of the choke used, uh, the result of the second shot, distance and choke, and also for the third shot, also recorded. Note that in the middle of the data sheet, we have a column for uh, shooter distance estimation. So we asked the shooter, hey, what was the, um, what was the range to that first shot that you took? And similarly, we also had the observers ask the hunter whether or not they hit or missed the bird on that shot for later comparison. Uh, observers annotated the species being fired upon and if a single shot killed uh, dove was obtained in that attempt then it was tagged and recorded uh, on the data sheet. Notice at the top uh, we have those circles that is to record um, the choke in the gun prior to the start of the hunt. Uh, additional information was recorded if the hunter chose to change chokes in the field during the hunt. So the observer cleared the weapon and made that measurement and then returned the firearm to the hunter. On the back of the data sheet, on the upper left side uh, is the ammunition box code in the brass color, the date and time of the hunt, the site of the hunt, the observer number and the shooter number. Uh, on the upper right side, we have the total number of birds taken by that hunter-observer pair. And on the lower right portion, we have the hunter questionnaire. And we asked the observer to ask the hunter uh, whether the shooter felt he or she was shooting lead steel or some other type of uh, ammunition or whether or not they didn't know, uh, whether the shooter and the party felt the performance of the shells were basically good, basically bad, or had no opinion. And we also asked the observer to record whether he had any uh, indication that the shooter attempted to gain or gain knowledge of the type of load being used in the field during the hunt. So the necropsy procedure was done with frozen specimens that were uh, collected after the hunt. We packaged them and shipped them off to our ballistician in his laboratories in Oregon, where his technicians would then, uh, at the start of each day, pull out carcasses at random, thaw them, and then take them over and get each bird x-rayed. Uh, in two planes, uh, an anterior posterior and a left lateral plane. During necropsy, um, the birds were weighed, defeathered by hand, and oriented on the x-ray plates to match um, what, what they were going to be doing in the radiograph. So we had a metal tag on the right leg of each specimen and that was used to orient the birds. Uh, radiographs were used to locate embedded pellets to identify broken bones and to verify penetration depths for those pellets which had not passed completely through a bird. Um, 
A necropsy form was used to record the location of all wounds, including broken bones, uh, which organs were struck, entrance points, exit points, wound angles uh, for each pellet strike, and if an embedded pellet was found on the x-ray, an attempt was made to find and remove that pellet during necropsy. If it could be located and removed, it was taped to the necropsy sheet with archival tape at the location of the wound and its type uh, noted. Uh, the wound channel depth and angle were annotated for each pellet strike on a specimen. And um, organ strikes, heart lung strikes, uh, spinal cord, brain strikes were examined for penetrations and any wounds to those critical areas were annotated on the necropsy form. In terms of statistical analysis, pretty straightforward. For the ammunition, we used uh, descriptive statistics to summarize uh, the ammunition characteristics as received from the manufacturer and we used analysis of variance to compare pattern counts and pattern efficiency by choke and distance for each load. Uh, similarly, for the field data, descriptive statistics were used to summarize observer test results, uh, the number of shots fired by each load, and the uh, shot outcomes by each load. We used analysis of variance then to compare the number of attempts, the number of shots fired, uh, shot distances between ammunition types, uh, hunters and observers. Chi-squared analysis was used to compare choke use and shot outcomes by ammunition type and distance category for all shots fired, for all hits, and for all necropsy birds. Similarly, chi-squared analysis was used to compare hunter knowledge of ammunition type and satisfaction with ammunition being used. For the necropsy data, descriptive statistics such as total strikes, through body strikes, penetration depths, all, all the metrics that were essentially counts um, were summarized using descriptive statistics and then we compared shot distances, total strikes, through body strikes, uh, and other count metrics using analysis of variance. Similarly, chi-squared was used to compare proportional distribution of uh, embedded pellet strikes, leg breaks, wing breaks, and uh, similar proportional data. results. So now we're going to talk about observer testing, uh, the results of ammunition testing, the field data, and the necropsy data results. If you have not read the paper or you do not have it handy, um, it's going to be a lot easier for you to go back after the fact and look at this more closely at your leisure. So we're going to try to go through it quickly, but um, it's a lot of information, so go, go get the paper and look at it again at your earliest convenience. In terms of observer test scores uh, for proficiency, our observers averaged 95% uh, uh, proficiency in 2008 and 98% proficiency in 2009, and we attribute that increase to um, good retention among the observers. So the people that showed up and, and went through the training in 2008 were, with a few exceptions, the same observers that we used again in 2009. So their skills just improved as time went on. We compared the ammunition received uh, in terms of specifications from the manufacturer and found that they were within the ammunition specs. So I want you to note that the lead 7.5 load was a 1 and 1 8 ounce shot load containing 410 pellets and it was fired at a uh, nominal velocity of 1285. The 
Steel number seven load was a one ounce load containing 411 pellets, uh, and it was fired at a nominal velocity of 1,326 feet per second. The steel number six load was also a one ounce load, but do note that it has 100 fewer pellets. It's 311 pellets uh, per load, per shell in that load, fired at a nominal velocity of uh, 1310. Our pattern test revealed that pattern counts differed significantly among ammunition types. Um, specifically, we found that pattern density and pattern efficiency among ammunition types differed depending on distance, choke constriction used, and the number of pellets in each load. Multiple comparison tests revealed that the lead 7.5 load and the FE7 load, the steel 7 load, pattern counts were not significantly different for most combinations of choke and distance. However, the steel 7 produced greater pattern counts than the lead 7.5 with full choke at 45.7 meters, modified choke at 36.6 meters, and improved cylinder at 45.7 meters. That information is contained in Table 2 or summarized in Table 2 in the paper. Now, there were a few general trends revealed by the pattern test. For instance, pattern, down, uh, pattern count decreased as a function of distance within all chokes and loads, albeit at a lower rate for the steel 6. Within each ammunition type, Pattern count increased as a function of choke for all distances greater than 18.3 meters. Uh, ammunition containing an equal number of pellets of similar size but with a higher diamond hardness value produced higher pattern efficiencies relative to comp comparable loads with softer pellets for each choke, constriction, and distance. Likewise, when you had pellets of similar hardness, pattern efficiency increased as a function of pellet size, i.e., when comparing, uh, for, uh, for instance, the steel 7 and steel 6 loads. Generally, both the test loads, the steel 7s and steel 6s, produced higher pattern efficiencies than the lead 7.5 control load. Field testing. Our observers recorded 5,094 shot outcomes yielding 1,146 bagged birds, 739 birds wounded, and 3,209 birds missed. That information is contained in Table 3 in the paper. Of the 1,146 birds bagged, 1,110 were necropsied and used in subsequent analyses. The number of shots fired and the number of temp, uh, attempts differed among shooters but did not differ among ammunition types used in the test, nor did it differ among ne necropsy specimens. That information was contained in Tables 4 and Table 5. Um, choke use differed among ammunition types for shots fired and for necropsy specimens. Uh, that couldn't be controlled, but we did want to make sure that we recorded that data to try to um, examine that further um, as we gained more information on each ammunition type. Using our hunter survey, we were uh, able to, d to prove that hunters were unable to discern ammunition type in the field, and 
guessed correctly less often than predicted by chance. Similarly, hunter perception of ammo quality was unrelated to shot type. Uh, and we note that hunters rated all ammunition as basically good 72.9% of the time. We found no difference between hunters and observers in their ability to recognize a hit, but there was a difference in ability to estimate distance. The linear regression coefficients indicated that hunters overestimated the range for closer targets and underestimated the range for more distance targets. Moving on, the frequency of birds bagged and missed differed between distance categories for all ammunition types, but the proportion of birds wounded did not differ between distance categories for any ammunition type. That data is summarized in Table 6. Looking at the field results at less than 30 yards, mean distance for all shots fired differed among ammunition types and between distance categories, but there was no ammunition distance interaction. Um, the estimated marginal means ranked lead 7.5 to be greater than steel 6, which was greater than steel 7 for all shots fired, but we note that the distances among means were less than one meter for all distances. Uh, on the table that's in front of you now, We're looking at harvest metrics. The shot outcomes, bagged, wounded, bagged per shot, wounded per shot, hits per shot, bags per hit, and wounded per hit. We were able to detect a significant difference only in hits per shot. In the less than 30 yard category, those proportions there are those metrics show you the, the values for that metric. For field results beyond 30 yards, same metrics, bag per shot, wounded per shot, hits per shot, bag per hit, and wounded per hit, we found no difference in the uh, metrics beyond 30 yards. However, when we look at all distances combined, we again see that hits per shot differed uh, between loads. And you can see that uh, more hits per shot were obtained with the FE, the Steel 7 load, than either the Steel 6 or the Lead 7.5 load. Necropsy results. You can see in the background of that image the necropsy technician uh, working on a bird. The x-rays are to her left, and you can see a data form uh, on the lab table in the right image with uh, a bird that has been scanned that had two pellet strikes. We looked at, again, necropsy results at less than and greater than 30 yards, so the results for less than 30 yards. Uh, note that we detected significant differences in the total number of strikes, the total number of through body strikes, the total number of embedded pellets, uh, the percentage of birds with embedded pellets, and the percentage of birds with leg breaks. The other metrics uh, percent through body strikes, the depth of through body strikes, the depth of embedded pellets, and the number of wing breaks did not differ among ammunition types. Similar story for the res necropsy results beyond 30 yards. Total strikes, total through body strikes, uh, embedded pellets, uh, percentage of birds with embedded pellets, and percentage of birds with leg breaks were significantly different among the ammunition types. 
However, the number, the percentage of birds with through body strikes, the through body strike depth, the embedded pellet depth, and the number of broken wings, or the percentage of birds with broken wings did not differ among ammunition types at the greater than 30 yard category. Combined, um, the same metrics are still uh, significant total strikes, through body strikes, embedded pellets, percentage of birds with embedded pellets, and percentage of birds with leg breaks were all significant. So let's go back and summarize what we've just um, covered in the results. So we're going to talk about harvest metrics and management implications. Note that in terms of harvest metric summary, that shot outcomes, the number of birds bagged, wounded, and missed, did not differ among ammunition types overall nor within either distance category. Hitting ability differed among ammunition types both overall and within 30 yards. The comparisons showed that lead 7.5 had fewer hits per shot fired than the steel 7 overall as well as fewer hits per shot fired than either the steel 7 or the steel 6 within 30 yards. So what are the management implications that we can take from this study? And there's uh, some generalities we can make. The first is, if pellet size, velocity, and composition are of sufficient lethality to penetrate and disrupt the vital organs of the target species, then our results suggest that pattern density is the most important factor influencing shot shell performance in the field. As such, hunters should reference credible lethality tables for selecting their shot sizes uh, and minimum load weights and choke constrictions in conjunction with pattern testing using their own shotgun and their own chokes. Based on our results, changes in ammunition use should not alter population harvest and therefore should not impact morning dove bag limits or season lengths. Okay, so you've waited all this time, now what? Well, migratory birds are a shared resource and they're managed through partnerships with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Canadian Wildlife Service as well as each of the states. Therefore, any discussions related to their management must involve all these parties and stakeholders. Texas Parks and Wildlife Department views these findings as one of many components involved in the ongoing and future morning dove management discussions. Other considerations include uh, such things as natural resource impacts, hunter attitudes, and ammunition availability. Texas Parks and Wildlife plans to use the findings to educate hunters about the effectiveness of shot shell alternatives for harvesting morning doves. And I want to specifically remind each of you that we used a randomized block design and that statistical design um, intentionally removed variability due to the individual hunter so that we could directly compare results of ammunition. The guy or gal holding the shotgun is the largest component of variance in any of your ammo lethality test. And therefore, this was one of the bigger contributions we made uh, during our lethality study, was through statistical analysis. At this point, 